Man, we're so glad you guys are here. And uh, man, can, can, I, I know no one got baptized in this service, but we've got 11 people declaring their faith today. Let's give it up for all them. Man, amazing. So exciting. Uh, and, and thank you for the honor, uh, Pastor Dan, Pastor Justin, Pastor Rick. Thank you guys. Number one, uh, it's an honor to serve alongside you guys uh, in, in pastoring this church. Um, I'm grateful for my wife, uh, who is the most beautiful, amazing, uh, just she's incredible. Uh, I, y'all absolutely must do better for my wife than what y'all just did right there. So, all right, thank you very much. Mainly because she hates it. Uh, so, but no, uh, she... Uh, thank, and thank you to my staff, and, and man, thank you guys as a church. I, I'm, I'm so honored to pastor this church, and, and uh, we're so excited about what God is doing. So I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. God is changing people's lives, and we get to be a part of it every Sunday. And uh, it's amazing. Taking over uh, as lead pastor, it's been quite a journey. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, uh, just a little little short snippet. We took over in, uh, on January 28th of 2018 uh, is when we took over as lead pastors. And, uh, and our son, Jabin, passed away on May 8th. 18th of 2018, so just months later. Um, and then about uh, a few months after that, uh, we got kicked out of the building we were in. Um, and just about a month after that, we found out that our landlord had stole tens of thousands of dollars from us. Uh, and so, uh, and then just after that, we found out we had about eight weeks to go portable at AMC movie theaters. Uh, and so we, we launched a portable church in eight weeks, which if you ever tried that, 10 out of 10, don't recommend. So, uh, but we, we did it. <laughs> God was faithful there. Uh, nine months into that, COVID hit. Um, and so the world shut down. And uh, just a few months into that, uh, kicked in a number of social and cultural, a lot of unrest. And uh, we're a very diverse body. Uh, everybody, you can look at wh- however, you can come from whatever, your past, your background, and your race, whoever. D- like, we care about who God wants you to be, and that's what we uh, So we're, we're a diverse church. And naturally, just everything that was going on with the world made that very complicated. And we're pastoring people that aren't allowed to look at each other face to face because the world really like. So all that to say, pastoring has been great. All right? So... <laughs> It's been, it's been awesome. <laughs> so I'm just kidding. No, the first three years were tough, but but here's the reality. The last three years have been absolutely phenomenal, and it's been amazing. It's been quite a journey. Uh, and in that process, we bought this. We bought the facility, and and uh, it was so cool because our very first Sunday here in the building, we had about 200 people. Um, and today, there's going to be close to 1,200 people are going to walk through the doors of this building in three years. So. And God's just doing some amazing things, and I'm super, super grateful to be at the helm. But I will tell you this, in the process of trying to find a building, we looked at almost 30 buildings. We tried to actively purchase almost 30 pieces of property trying to find the next church that we were supposed to be in. And man, it was tough. I'm not going to lie to you. And there was an element of the journey of thinking to myself, like, God, did you really call me to this? Like, is this, is this for real? Because this is like way harder than I feel like it should be, right? Like, uh, it, there, there was elements of the journey of me being like, I don't know, God. Like, maybe you got the wrong one. Maybe I, like, just the whole journey. How many of you guys know when the journey gets hard, you're tempted to give up, yeah. right? And, and, and you, can, you can know that God, you can know that God spoke to you, but how many guys know when your heart knows something and when your mind starts telling you it's a lie, you, you have some conflict going on? And it, and it brings me to this, because I believe God desires that all of us would live a fruitful life. Say fruitful. That's why we've been in the fruitful series, that God wants us to live a fruitful life. And I believe that God has given every one of us a dream about what our life should look like and what it should be and, and how we should walk that out. But the question I have is, have you ever lost sight of the dream for your life? Like, have you ever lost sight of, I know, I, I feel like God has called me to have a, a fruitful life, right? A, a healthy marriage, kids that love God, a, a, a career that I don't hate, right? Like uh, a degree that, you know, I've been going at, like, I feel like God has called me to certain things that I would live a fruitful life. And I feel like I'm struggling to the degree that maybe you've lost the dream for your life. But here's the other question I have for you. If there were no limitations, say limitations. If there were no limitations, what could God do in your life? Like if you were willing to take the, the shackles off the dream for a second, if you, if you were willing, if, if you sat back and said, God, I'm going to say yes to everything you call me to, what could happen in your life? 
And I know everybody wants to live. How, how many guys know we, we want to be, essentially, we want to, we want to be abundant in a couple ways in our lives. And the two biggest ones that we talk to people is, one, is they want to have a healthy spiritual journey with God. Like, I, I want to have a, a journey with God. And I want to invite you uh, to say yes to something that I believe will help you throughout this year. And I want to invite you to join our TC prayer culture at Transformation Church. And the TC prayer culture uh, is a group. Of, we just got done with 21 days of prayer. So today's day 22. And the TC prayer culture is for the people that are saying, I don't want to just be day 21 people. I want to be day 22 people. And so I want to commit, like, I want prayer to be an active part of my life, not just for me, but for our church. And if that's you, there is a group of people that behind the scenes get an email from me every month. And it's a direction email of this is where God's leading us. This is what you can be praying for. And this is how we believe God's going to help impact our city through Transformation Church. And if you want to be part of that, I invite you to scan the QR code, fill out the little form at the bottom that says TC Prayer Culture, and you can jump on the board with us. We don't, we don't ask you of anything, nothing like that. It's just strictly us helping guide you in prayer culture. And we believe that you're closer to God when you do it. All right. And so we want to invite you to do that. The second thing we want to uh, introduce to you, because I believe God, that all of us want to live in a spiritual abundance, but how many guys also want to live in favor from God, like blessings and abundance from God. And the second thing I want to invite you to say yes to is the first fruits offering. And at Transformation Church, we only take up two special offerings a year. Our Bridge Builders offering, that's around November to December, and then our First Fruits offering, which will be March 3rd. And the First Fruits offering, just to give you a little education on what that is, as we follow the Jewish history on this, where in the Old Testament, they would go, as they would plant a vineyard, they would go into the vineyard, and the very first fruit that would be produced, they would tie a ribbon around it. And they would reserve, we would, they would reserve that harvest to give to God as an offering. And they would say, God, as we give you the first fruit, our first harvest, we're believing that every harvest after this is going to be blessed. And they would bring it to him and God would bless every harvest after the first fruit. And so in the first quarter in March, we're going to bring God a first fruit offering. And I'm inviting you, if you want to participate in it, to say, God, I'm bringing this as a sacrificial offering, believing that everything else that happens throughout this year, you're going to bless my home and my life and my finances in Jesus name. Right. And so I'm inviting you to say yes to it. Whatever way you say yes to it is up to you. So if you say yes, my encouragement is you pray to God about what you should give. And whatever he says, just say yes to God. I don't need to know. No one else needs to know. That's between you and God, all right? There are some people, there are a lot of people are bringing a week's salary saying, God, I'm giving this. There are a couple of people I know that are bringing a month's salary saying, God, I'm giving this. Whatever God speaks to your heart, you just be obedient to God. But we're going to give in obedience, praying that God would be faithful in return. And the reason that I know this works is because as we were looking for building after building, as we were looking for... You know, as a pastor, I'm saying, God, like, we need help. And, and, and how many guys know when you, don't feel, when you don't feel God coming through, you start trying to make it happen on your own? Come on, anybody guilty? Seven, eight, nine of us, the rest of you, liars. All right, so how, how many guys know when, when we feel like God is delaying his answer, we try to take it into our own hands? And I remember we were, there were certain buildings that it was so obvious weren't going to work for us, but we were trying to make it happen. And, and, and finally, I was just praying to God one day, and God said, why don't you do your job and I'll do mine? And here's what, he, here's what he said, and maybe this will be helpful for you. This isn't in your notes, but you can have it for free. All right, he said this. He said, you be, you be obedient, and I'll be in charge of abundance. So he said, your job is obedience. My job is abundance. Your job is faithfulness. My job is fruitfulness. He says, why don't you do your job, and I'll do mine. And from the moment we said yes to God, to our obedience and letting God be in charge of abundance, he's opened every door we've needed to be open. And my invitation to you is, what could happen if we started channeling obedience rather than trying to make abundance happen? And we could let God make our lives fruitful. In 2 Corinthians 9, he says this. He says, and God is able, say able, to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. How many want God to give you all that you need at all times and all things that you do? You're looking for God, make, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to be faithful. God, you do your job with abundance, right? And what are we doing? We're putting it in the hands of God saying, you've challenged me to just walk as a Christian to trust you. I'm trusting you, God, because I don't know about you. There have been seasons in my life where even I've, in my obedience, have tried to challenge God, believing that I was, because I was doing all these things, working hard, grinding, trying to put in the work that God owed me something. But the reality is, it's my obedience and my faithfulness that God blesses in abundance. Not just my obedience to work, but my obedience to trust. And that's what God leads us to. And there's a story in the Bible in Genesis 37 where we see 
this idea show up in the story of Joseph. And if you don't know the story of Joseph, essentially he, his uh, father had many sons, and, and he was the favorite son. Uh, and the problem was he told all the other sons he was the favorite son. Now, any of you, didn't know, any of you that have siblings know that's a bad idea, right? And so he, he told his brothers, I'm the favorite, and he even had some dreams. And he was able to interpret dreams due to his connection to God. So he had these dreams. He said, you're going to bow down to me. Right? So he, he essentially tells his brothers, all of you are going to bow to me. And they're like, ah. Because how many guys that have siblings know that conversation would not go as well as you hoped? Right? And in Genesis 37, 19 through 20, Joseph is going out to them to carry a message. And this is what they say. They say, here comes that dreamer. He said, they said to each other, come on, now let's kill him. Now, here's the reality. The one thing that, I, this isn't part of the sermon, but I just want you to have it just in case. You got to be careful who you share your dreams with because everybody's not capable of dreaming on your level. Sometimes what God gave you was a personal message and not a group text. You hear me? Everybody else didn't get the info that God gave you and the dream that God gave you. And sometimes it's your job to be faithful to what God gave you because everybody else didn't get that information. So they can't believe in faith with what God gave you because God only gave it to you. But that's a different message for a different day. Come on, let's kill them and throw him in one of these pits. And they said that a ferocious animal would devour him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Because the first thing I want you to understand is we're growing in our dreams. As we're believing God for the life that he gave us. The first thing I want you to understand is that the enemy is not interested in destroying you. He's interested in destroying what God has put in you. He's not interested in destroying you. He's interested in destroying what God has put in you. He's interested in destroying the dream. He's interested in destroying the purpose. He's interested in destroying the faithfulness. So, so he's not interested in destroying you. Like I believe according to the Bible and according to God's word that, that we have a security in our faithfulness to God when it comes to our eternity. That, that as we place our faith in Jesus and we are entrusted to him, that Jesus holds us secure. And as he holds us secure, we, we're faithful to him. And we're faithful to God. And hear me, I don't believe that the enemy is capable capable of pulling us out of God's hand. But what he is capable of doing is making us, like, making us completely and utterly useless all the way to heaven. So I don't, I don't believe enemies, the enemy's great strategic goal is to get you into hell. It's to let you go to heaven, just not bring anybody with you on the way. So he, he wants to silence the dreams because your dreams could live to a life of fruitfulness. And if your dreams could live to a life of fruitfulness, it'll show faithfulness and your faithfulness gives glory to God. And so the enemy doesn't want to kill. That's why John 10.10 10 says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He, he wants to kill the thing that is in you. And when we look at Genesis 37, we go back to the story. But Reuben, the older brother, heard it, and he rescued them out of his hand, saying, let's not take his life. Thank God for Reuben. He said to them, shed no blood, but throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him. And so what happens is they throw him in the pit. And if you know the story, he ends up getting sold into slavery, right? Because here's the next thing I want you to understand. What the enemy can't destroy, he'll try to make dormant. So if he can't destroy the dream, he'll be content with you having the dream as long as you're not pursuing the dream because you just live. So it's not that the dream died. It's just that it just died within you. It's not that God doesn't have a plan of fulfilling it. He just, he's, in, he's brought you to a place that you're so discouraged, you can't see how God would do it. And since you can't see how God would do it, how many guys know when we can't see how God would do it, then we just, we've given over to ourselves that God won't do it. And that's the struggle that we're in. And that's where Joseph's at in this, which brings me to the next thing that I want you to understand is that when all things are going like that and the dream becomes dormant, you'll be tempted to trade your God dream for a good enough dream. So God, God's giving you this dream of fruitfulness and faithfulness and a life where your family's thriving, your marriage is thriving, your work is thriving, your education is thriving, your degree field is thriving. All these things are thriving. The problem is when you can't see how that's going to work, you trade the God dream of greatness for a good enough dream of mediocrity. Where it's like, ah, as long as we're not trying to kill each other, we're doing pretty good. Come on, anybody? In, <laughs> how's your marriage going? Well, you know, no one's called the cops lately. Like, <laughs> right? Like, but no. Now we say that, but here's the deal. Like, that's kind of where some of us fall. And when we look at Genesis 40, 
14 through 15, we carry on in the story. What ultimately happens is Joseph gets accused of rape and thrown in prison because he, was, he gets put into the, the master's home. So he actually ends up becoming second in charge to the master's home, but then accused of rape and thrown in prison. So he's gone from the pit to royalty, or being in the home of royalty, and now he's been arrested, accused of rape and thrown into prison. How many guys know this dude is doing this in life right now? Can anybody relate to a life that looks like this? Right? And so he's in prison and two guys that are in prison with him have dreams. Well, Joseph can interpret, t- in- interpret dreams because of God's gift that he's given him. And so he interprets the dreams, and he says, one of you is going to be restored back to the palace with Pharaoh. And this is what he says in verses 14 and 15. When all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, say here. Even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in the dungeon. And I think this is so interesting because when we look at Joseph's language right here, he stopped talking about the dream and he's just talking about justice. He stopped talking about what God wants for him. He, he stopped thinking about where God wants him to be. He stopped thinking about the dream that God has for him, where, where the, the hay bales are going to bow, where, where, where he's going to be placed in a high. He stopped thinking about all that. All he's thinking of is, God, just get me out of this right now. And maybe you can relate to the idea and the seasons of your life where you stop thinking about all the things that God wants for you and all you're thinking is, God, get me out of this. Come on, anybody ever been in a this season where you're like, God, I don't even care about all the greatness you promised. I just want out of this. But have you ever realized that your faithfulness in the middle of this is truly what leads to whether or not you get out of and get into the dream again? You see, Let me just help you out for a second. Don't sell out on God's dream for your life in the waiting time. And and Joseph's in this waiting. He's in this in-between. And I remember with my brother Tom, he got in a motorcycle accident in 2010. And, and, uh, and the doctors told us he wasn't going to make it. Like he's, they, they told us, they brought organ donor papers. You need to sign these so that we can donate his organs. After Christmas Day, we're turning the machines off. And we had gotten this promise from God. Our dream was that God said he's going to live. He will live and not die and declare the good works of the Lord. Like that's what we believed in our heart. That was the word we got from God. And on day one, we believed it. On day 12, we believed it. On day 20, we kind of believed it. On day 35, how many guys know we weren't sure if we believed it? Because in the waiting time, you're tempted to sell out on God's dream. And it was in the waiting that we were like, man, we believe it. We believe it. I think we believe it. I'm pretty sure we believe it. I kind of believe it. God, do I believe it? Was this really God or was this us just trying and hoping for the right thing, even though we don't know what God wants for it? And and the temptation was to lean into the, this is so impossible. I don't think God will do it. But here's the deal. When God spoke it, when God gives you the dream for your life, when God tells you what he's going to do, you have to be faithful even in the waiting time. And it was in the waiting room. Listen, we took over that waiting room, y'all. I'm telling you, like, we lived in that bad boy for a month and a half. Now, you may think, like, we were there a lot. No, no, no. Air mattresses, pillows, blankets, Xbox, TV, catered food. We lived in that joint. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We were in that hospital. To the degree that, uh, at the time, Sacred Heart, now, they, they changed the policy of waiting rooms because of us. <laughs> You're welcome. But how many guys know in the waiting room, you're tempted to stop believing in the dream that God has for you? And our faithfulness in the waiting is what declares whether or not we trust God. That's why Galatians 6, 9 says this. It says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We stay faithful to what we know God has given us. But hear me, don't let your waiting cause you to wonder. Don't let your waiting cause you to wander. Don't let your waiting cause you to drift away from what you know God has given you. Don't let your waiting and the, the pain in the waiting and the confusion in the waiting and the, what you feel like God has delayed in the waiting and you're not sure what he's doing in the waiting. Don't let your waiting cause you to wander. Listen, your faithfulness in the waiting is going to dictate the, the way in which you come out and start pursuing the dream again. And so we have to be, we're faithful in the waiting time because it's in the waiting time that God is assessing and building our character so that when we get out of this thing and we start pursuing the dream again, our faithfulness has proven to God that we can be trusted with what he ultimately wants to hand us. And Joseph's in this prison and all he can think about is get me out of here. And don't trade in your dream. Don't trade a God dream for a good enough dream. Because here's the reality. Our dreams become dormant when we trade them for our desires. 
Our dreams become dormant when we trade them for our desires. How many of you know your desires will lead you astray every time? And man, we see it. We see it. That's, that, the reality is, even when you look at Eve in the garden, when she ate the fruit, the enemy's temptation was not to get her to eat fruit. The enemy's temptation to her was to convince her that there was an element of fruitfulness that God was withholding from her. That God, God there, there is part of God you're not going to get to have because you're not allowed to do this thing that God told you not to do. It had nothing to do with the fruit. It had everything to do with, let me change how you see God. And if I could change how you see God, you'll change, you'll, you'll trade your dreams for your desires. And that's exactly what she did. And that's our temptation to fall every time. Listen, trade in your God dream for just the desires of your heart. But how many guys know those desires don't always lead us in the right direction? That's why James 1, 13 through 14 says, when, <clears throat> says this, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted by his what? Own evil desires. And he is lured away and enticed. But here's the reality about our desires. And this is what I just think is true. I think that our desires are the things that tempt us away. But it's not the, it's not the huge things that we're tempted to do that, we, that we're attracted to, right? Like, it, it's not the worst thing that we can think of that we're tempted to lean into. It's not the, the casualties that we're tempted to give way to. Hear me? It's actually, it, it's not usually the despicable sins that deter us, it's the permissible ones. Like, like for example, it's not, it's not murder that usually will deter you, it's just gossip. It's, it's not having an affair that is your temptation, it's just flirting. Oh, it's quiet today. Right? It's not idol worship that you're tempted to do, it's just overworking. Your, your, tem, your, your great temptation in your life, listen, isn't that you would kill someone, it's that you would gossip about someone. The great, and, and here's what we do. We're, the reason we're tempted by the permissible sins is we'll look at the bad stuff and go, I'm not going to do the bad thing, but God, since I didn't do the bad thing, don't judge me on the, on the little thing that I've done. Not realizing that God looks at all of them the same way. When we don't reflect Christ, he goes, that and that are the same in my book, right? Why? Because you're hurting someone there the same way you're hurting someone there. And because that's the case, listen to me, we got to realize that just because we've made them permissible in my mind doesn't mean that God's made it permissible in his. And so what we do is we, it's, not the, it's not the worst of the worst of the worst that tempts us. It's the things that we say, I know God said I'm not supposed to do this, but. And so what do we do? We start walking in the way that we know we shouldn't be going just so that we can feel. And what do we also do? We surround ourselves with people that we think we're better than so we can point at their sins so we don't feel bad about ours. Well, I'm not as bad as Trisha because Trisha's wild. And if your name is Trisha in here, by the way, I just, that was a random name I picked out of thin air. Okay. So don't, don't be offended, <laughs> but like, like I got, look at God. Hey, don't, I, I know I still, I know I got this loose tongue and I got this anger problem. And I know, I know I'm constantly snapping on people, but I'm not nearly as bad as, come on, help me out. That I, I, I know, like, I know I probably shouldn't flirt with that person like that, but so-and-so has been cheating on his wife for a decade. So like, I, it's, if you have a problem, it's obviously with him, not with me. And what do we do? We surround ourselves with people we feel superior to so that we don't have to fix the problems in ourselves. But here's the deal. They're only accountable to their dream. You're accountable to yours. And your desires are causing you to lose track of your dream. And you think that just because somebody else is worse than you, that it has an impact on your trajectory. It doesn't. You're accountable for what God called you to. And they're accountable to what God called them to. And you look at James 1.17. Do not be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. God's desire for us as we dream is to realize what he's capable of. So hear me, I only give you this as we get ready to wrap up today because the reality is this, you can trust God to finish what he started. As we're talking about dreaming, you can trust God to finish what he started. If he gave you the dream and he started you on the journey, you can have every confidence that he's gonna finish the journey with you and for you in your life. And hear me, I, I, Pastor Dan, my dad brought me up on this message in, for, uh, to always inspire our faith and our family and in the ministry that listen to me, God never starts anything on earth he hasn't already finished in heaven. 
So you might be at the beginning of the journey now, but God's already written the end of the journey. You may be in the middle of what you call chaos now, but God already knows what the outcome is going to be. You may be in the prison portion of your journey now, but God knows what the fulfillment of your journey will look like. So don't, don't worry about where you're at. Pray about where you're at. Be faithful about where you're at, but don't worry about where you're at because God will lead you ultimately to where he wants you to be. Listen, your job in the meantime is to hold on to the dream. Be faithful in the process. Be faithful in the journey. Lean into his desires. Reflect his character. Don't lose sight of who you're supposed to be. Maintain your integrity and declare, I'm going to trust God. No matter what, I'm going to trust God because I know he knows the beginning from the end. And I'm going to be faithful because your job isn't abundance, it's obedience. And when you look at Genesis 41, we see the end of the story with Joseph. And Pharaoh has a dream, and Joseph gets to go interpret the dream. And as he goes to interpret the dream, he describes it to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is so impressed by this gift that God has given Joseph that this is what he says. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Listen, he went from a hole in the ground to being in charge of the whole land. He said, I put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. And he had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. Why? Because there's something in Joseph saying, I'm not going to give up on this dream. I'm not, I know this is what God gave me. I know this is what God wants to do. Not for me, but for his glory. God wants to get something out of this and I'm gonna be faithful to it. I'm gonna stay faithful to it. Why? Because you have to have faith to continue in the process of the dream. Stay faithful. Have faith in the process of the dream. That's why Hebrews 11, one, and I, and I, I wanna give it to you in the living Bible paraphrase because I think it, it communicates it so well. It says, what is faith? It is the confident assurance that something we want is going to happen. It is the certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us, even though we cannot see it up ahead. Some of you know, know it better. Faith is the substance of things hoped for with the evidence of things not yet seen. It's going, I don't see any way God's going to do this. I don't know the way in which he's going to execute. I don't even, honestly, I don't even see how he's going to open the next door. But my faith tells me to have the hope that God's going to do everything he said he's going to do. And because of that, we can trust him. We can trust him with our lives. So as, as we think about this, here's a question that I want you to think about. What's on your hope list? If, if faith is, the, is what we're hoping for without having seen it. What's on your hope list? Is your hope list for that your marriage would reflect Christ in every way, including how you love one another? Is your hope list that your kids would come to put their faith in Jesus? Is your hope list that, that your career would finally lead to abundance uh, for you and for your family? Is it that the degree you've been trying to get for years, will find you, that you would finally have what it takes to go through? What is on your hope list? And here's what I would encourage you to do. I want to encourage you to really think about this and use it as homework. What, what's on my hope? What am I believing for? Right, right now, Ashley and I, we, we have a few things in our home right now that we're believing for that's on our hope list. And we're saying, all right, God, we, we feel like you've given us this as a dream. So we're going to be faithful in the process. We're also going to look for you to open the right door so that we know we can walk through so that we can get to the ultimate thing that you've called us to. We've got a list. Literally, they are written down there in my office and I pray over them every day. This is my hope list. This is what I, I don't see how you're going to do it yet, but I'm trusting you're going to do it. This is my hope list. And what I'm doing is I'm praying with those in faith every day. The question is like, how do we pray for that kind of thing though? Like sometimes it can feel selfish to be like, all right, God, these are all the things I want. And it's like, I don't know if that's the way to do it. What does it look like? And more importantly, because we serve a sovereign God, what does it look like to pray to a God that we know knows the beginning from the end? What, how do we do that? And I think the best way we can understand how our prayer life should be is actually found in the story in Daniel chapter three with Shadrach, Meshach, and a billy goat. And, uh, sorry, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
in Genesis chapter 3. And if you know the story, there are three Hebrew boys that were, the king told them they had to bow down and worship an idol. And when they were, they, they told the king, we only worship God. And so the king said, if you don't bow down and worship an idol, I'm going to throw you into a furnace of fire. And, and so they said, this is what they said in Daniel 3, 17 through 18. They said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he doesn't, we're not bowing down to your idol. And I think that's the greatest template for prayer you could ever have. We know you can. We believe you will. But even if you don't, we trust you. God, I I want this for my marriage, and I know you can touch my marriage. I'm believing you will touch my marriage, but even if it never gets better, I'm going to be faithful to the covenant you called me to, right? I'm believing that you, I know you can rescue my children. I'm believing you're going to hold my children dear to your heart, but even if I don't see anything happening in the journey, I'm going to trust you no matter what. I believe you can take care of their career. I'm trusting that you're going to open the right doors, but even if nothing changes and I'm stuck at this job for the rest of my life, I'm going to be on a mission field here because I know you've called me to a place and you've given me a dream. I believe you can. I believe you will. But no matter what, you're God and I'm not. My job is obedience, God. Your job is abundance. And listen, I believe that's exactly how our prayer life should reflect. I know you can. I'm believing you will. But even if you don't do it my way, even if I missed the mark somehow in what you want and what I'm believing for, two different things, I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to call you a failure because you didn't do it my way. I'm not going to deny your goodness just because you didn't show up the way I wanted you to. No, I'm going to trust you. So how do we do that? Well, here's the thing that I think is the best way you can do it. So like today, tomorrow, as you're working through the things that you're believing God for, your dream for your life, what you feel like God has placed on your heart, Here's what I encourage you to do. Write it down, pray over it, and surrender it. Write down what you're believing God has given you as a dream for your life. Pray over it every day and surrender it to God, trusting him with all of it. Now, here's the deal. Those first two, we're pretty good at that. Boy, that last one, Come on, help me out. Surrender? Nah, I'm not doing that. Because I don't know about you, I can only speak for myself on this. I'm really good at telling God what he's supposed to do. Oh, okay, there's a few others in here too. Nice, very good. I, I, I'm really good at, hey God, let me, show, let me show you the pathway that I would take if I were you. Come on, anybody? Come on, don't be self-righteous right now. Anyway, God, if, if I were you, this is what I would do. God's like, cool, 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 cool. Get out of my way. <laughs> but how many guys like me have also realized when he does it his way, it may not feel better in the, in the midst of it, but it's always the better outcome, better than I could have ever hoped for. I know you can. I believe you will. No matter what, I trust you. Even if you don't, even if you do it differently, I trust you. And here's the challenge. What kind of difference would it make if you started dreaming about what God wants for your life again? It could change the way you live your life. It could change the way you show up at work. It could change the way that you love people. It would change the way you do everything. Start dreaming about what God wants for your life again, and let's go after it. Let's let 2024 be a year of fruitfulness. You guys with me today? All right, let me pray for you. Father, we thank you. We love you. We're so grateful for you. God, I pray for every person that's here today, Lord, that you speak to our hearts, you encourage us to know that, God, everything you're leading us to, everything you're doing in our lives, God, it's it's an opportunity to be faithful. So God, I pray for every person that's watching online, that's here in the room, that God, you, you help us in our obedience and we'll trust you in abundance. Help us keep saying yes to everything you called us to and to the dream you've given us. We thank you today and we love you in Jesus' name. If you're here today and you say, Brad, I I wanna trust God with my life, but I gotta be honest with you, he's not the Lord of my life. 
I know about Jesus, but Jesus is not my Savior. And here's the idea of fruitfulness. Fruitfulness comes from the Father, and you can only be close to God, the Father, without sin. The problem is we all have sin. And when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for our sins so that we could be close to God again. And today, if there's a longing in your heart to be close to him, but you know there's some things in your life that have separated you from him, today I want to invite you to step into forgiveness. And the way you do that is faith, by putting your faith in God, putting your faith in Jesus that when he died on the cross, he paid for your sins. That belief is what leads you to forgiveness. And today, if that's you, you say, Brad, I I want a fresh start. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me. I believe you rose again from the dead. And I want to surrender my life. If that's you, I invite you to pray this prayer and let these prayer, let this prayer be words that represent the belief that you have in your heart that Jesus is now the Lord of your life. And we're going to pray together so you're not praying by yourself. So let's pray, church. Say, Dear Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my wrongs. I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. So I give you my life. Make me brand new. Give me a fresh start and I'll worship you forever. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. TC, let's give it up for all those that pray that today and we celebrate with you. Amazing.